Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's amazing to have so many of you here. Um, today's event is an exciting one. It's a collaboration between the Green Gross Young People's Programme, funded by the Green Gross Family, and the Knowledge Share Programme, which creates skills sharing, training and professional development opportunities for UK museum and heritage colleagues, thanks to the support of the Bivmar Foundation. So we'll be handing over to the BM's Youth Collective in just a minute. But before we start, I have some housekeeping to run through. So this session is being recorded and will be posted to the BM Events YouTube channel afterwards if you want to catch up on anything. But for now, we're filming live and the chat function is open, so please do get the conversation going. We want to create a safe environment for discussion and sharing ideas, so please follow the museum's code of conduct, which is protect privacy, please don't share anyone's personal information, stay on topic and be respectful. So I'm sure you're excited to get started, so I'm going to hand over to Afzal, who will introduce the British Museum Youth Collective and our brilliant speakers to the stage. Hello, I'm Afzal Khan and I will be your host for today. Welcome to the fifth event of the Knowledge Share Spring Event Series. Thank you for joining us. Please do get comfortable as we're in for a treat. We're delighted to be joined by the Youth Collective, which is a group of 18 to 24 year olds working in co-production with the British Museum to help engage other young people with the museum and make it more meaningful to young people. The current Youth Collective have been meeting since June 2020 and owing to the pandemic have been working entirely virtually. Since starting, they've, made, they've met various members of museum staff and in October last year, they ran a series of events on the topic of change, reflecting on how 2020 meant huge change not only for them, but the museum and wider society as well. This event is part of a short series called Unlocking the Museum, and it's taken from the idea that for many young people, trying to enter the museum and heritage sector, heritage sector can be like coming up against a closed door. The Youth Collective is keen to try and open the door for young people and help make the sector more inclusive. So today, the Youth Collective is joined by two brilliant speakers. Aksana Khan is a youth engagement producer who, basic, who basically organizes stuff to get stuff done. She's a big advocate for young people of color from working class backgrounds and creative fields. She's worked between learning programming and marketing for a range of organizations in London and the West Midlands. Michelle McGrath founded the museum as Muck Network in June 2018 frustrated at the lack of working class people in the museum sector. She's a leader with superb fac facilitation skills, a passionate spoke spokesperson for working class people in museums and a change maker in the sector. Michelle qualified as a teacher before pursuing a career in museums, learning over, museum learning over a decade, decade ago and now leads teams to develop, de deliver learning and engagement programs. The Youth Collective are looking forward to answering your questions at the end, so please do send them in using the Q&A function. I'll come back on screen at the end of the presentation. I will now hand over to Alyssa. Hello, I'm Alyssa and I just wanted to start off by asking you uh, if you could highlight some of the challenges that people of colour and working class individuals as well uh, currently face in the sector. Great, thank you Alyssa. Um, so it's still 2021 and we're still in a global pandemic. Um, which means that comes with its own challenges, because if we're talking about all the youth engagement and recruitment stuff um, in, this, in the art sector, you guys are handling like a really tough crisis at the moment, not just in terms of like what you're doing with your career, but also mental health and also just how entrenched barriers have become over the past year. Um, so you're navigating a lot. <laughs> And with that, you've got the pandemic amplifying things that we know to be true about the museum sector on the whole, that it is quite classist and it's quite racist as a sector too. So you're navigating those barriers. Um, and that affects how museums do the work. So we have a Eurocentric interpretation of our heritage. We have white saviorism when it comes to community engagement. We face more discrimination as well when it comes to applying for jobs as well. Um, and yeah, it's just tough. It's tough at the moment. And when you've got all of that going on in the background, anything to do with diversity and inclusion, it's written off. It's not necessarily seen as non-negotiable to just counteract the barriers that I've mentioned. So yeah, Gen Z, like I feel for you guys. <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, Alexana. Um, yeah, I feel for everyone right now, but um, 
you know, particularly for oppressed groups such as people of colour and, and the working class community, um, not only have they been disproportionately affected by the global pandemic, um, they've also been um, kind of left out of the museum agenda traditionally. Um, and I think, you know, if we're just thinking about some of the basic structural barriers that, that these groups face, um, first and foremost, you know, are museums relevant to these groups um, in their <clears throat> representation within their collections, their programming, their staffing, um, you know, muckers who are working class members of the museum's muck network. So I'm using a bit of jargon there already, sorry. But, um, you know, when, when before they got into museum careers, it, it is not necessarily somewhere that they saw themselves being. Um, so it's like, how can you kind of aspire to be part of um, the museum sector when you don't see yourself there? And then once you get into museums, if somehow magically you found this kind of connection and energy to be in it, it's about the barriers that you face um, getting into museums and working in, in them and being in them. So, you know, I think today we're gonna talk a bit about getting into the sector and, and a lot of the issues surrounding surrounding pay and um, volunteering, low wage, uh, low wages. I've already said, um, but just also the culture once you're in there and, and barriers for for working class people. Um, I can speak about which is things like um, your language, the way that you look, the way that you dress. Um, you know, feeling like an imposter, um, and also other colleagues in the sector assuming that you share the same experiences as them, making you feel um, incredibly kind of um, prejudiced against. And it just being a bit of a hostile environment to be in. Yeah, did that answer your question, Alyssa? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. And. You talked about a lot of barriers, both of you mentioned a lot of barriers, and I was wondering how important do you think that it is to have um, uh, connections to people in the cultural sector? Because I think that most people often actually don't have those connections, uh, those initial connections. And so how do you think, um, how do you think you start in the, in the cultural sector without those prior connections? And, and do you think it encourages nepotism as well? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where when you want a career in the arts, it's not a level playing field when you're trying to enter it and you really do feel it the longer you stay in the arts sector. Um, so when it comes to, I guess, navigating that, that it's really, really important to build some sort of like confidence to be able to start networking, to find people who are just like you. And it does take quite a while to get to that point. Um, for me personally, networking was actually the saving grace because I wouldn't have found out what my options were if I hadn't just like, and I really want to emphasize this, but professionally DMing people and asking them if they wanted to have a coffee or like to have a meeting to talk through the options. And like, what I really love about the museum sector is even though like, yes, there are, there are structural barriers in place, there is so much camaraderie amongst especially like working class and POC members of our sector who really want to make sure that young people get the leg up because there's no point like I think right now everyone just wants more of us in there because there's no point being the only person in the room I think the idea of like being the model minority has just gone out the window so yeah for changing sectors it's really important to just reach out yeah, I'm just nodding along there. Um, 100% um, agree that, you know, um, nepotism is rife in the sector um, and has been from the beginning. Um, I think in terms of networking as a tool, I resisted it for a really long time just because I think, well, number one, I think maybe I just wasn't as confident about it and partly I was a bit like oh what's networking that's a bit cringe um and I and number three I didn't know how to do it if like you know I I, I didn't know how to um navigate professional workspaces I didn't have that experience but um 
I would say that it is worthwhile um, doing. So um, think about, um, you know, who, who you are and what you're bringing. Um, and remember that you are just as entitled to be in the sector as anybody else. And um, as Exana says, find your community. And that's a brilliant way to start. So um, think about the people that you share values in common with and connect with them and have that as your kind of base network. Um, and you'll start to make connections and, you know, um the, the the museum community is relatively small at the end of the day um and it is um pretty pretty kind like you know once you do reach out to people they 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 say yes and they go for coffees with you um so learn how to network and um reach out to to those communities yeah and like to just build up on what michelle said I think networking as a phrase seems really intimidating because when you go through school, people are like, you need to get to know the ma your manager's manager and the director. And it's always like, how high up the ladder can you go? But like, as much as you can go that way, there's also so much merit in going sideways as well and getting to know your mates on the same course as you and people on the same like level as you and sharing the same job title too, because you never know where people are going to end up. So yeah, like you guys are your own network as well, especially being part of the youth collective like it's going to be really exciting to see what each of you are going to come up with in the next year so yeah yes all all young people join together and take over yes please <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that question Alyssa um I think we're moving on to Olivia now Hi, so the question that I'm going to ask you both um, surrounds volunteering and I'm sure there's lots of people watching today who are very aware of the breadth of voluntary roles available within this sector um, and although volunteering can provide you with a lot of skills and you can meet a lot of new people, it isn't accessible to everyone. Um, there are people who can't volunteer because it's not financially viable to them or that they can't commit to that time, they need to be working um, for during the week. So I guess my question to you is, how can we navigate this kind of expectation to work for free um, in order to kind of secure that first job in the sector um, when it isn't financially viable for many? And how can we make it the responsibility of museums to factor in that social barrier um, when considering applications? That's a great question, Olivia. Um, yeah, so, I think it took a while for me to un like to realize this but young people like you're always going to be marketed to when it comes to public programming so if you get to know what uh, what different organizations are doing you can effectively shop around because fundamentally you are justifying someone else's job so what you want to do is assess what what kind of organization slash program volunteering program you want to um, take part in but ultimately don't do it at the risk of your own well-being. Like no organization is worth you going into your overdraft. Like I can't emphasize this enough. And when you have someone who has like, especially when you're starting out and like you see your age mate and they've got all these like fashionable logos and they're LinkedIn and it looks great, but they're either well-connected or they're broke. <laughs> and ultimately like think about what do you want to prioritize and when you're in a position where you are financially able to look after yourself that is a massive accomplishment and if you have a gatekeeper who challenges that like screw them but that's not a place that you want to be working for um so yes know what your what your boundaries are so your time capacity so for me when I was at uni I couldn't afford to work with no pay for longer than like five days and it was just more like what what did I really want to get out of it and secondly, like have a punk attitude and fight back. Like, n like have an internal deadline of how long do you want to have the phrase volunteer or intern on your CV for? Because especially when you are that age gap between 8 to 25, there's so much out there. You're going to feel like at the end of the day, like a perpetual intern. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, when, when do you know that you're ready for the next thing? And I think the, the other thing I was going to suggest is, 
as great a career in museums is, like it's not the be all and end all, there are other places who would be more than happy to take you. And I know it might feel really soul crushing when you're applying for jobs in the first place, but there's loads of art sectors out there that who really want the skill set and the insights that you bring in their, in their field as well. So there's loads of options, even when it doesn't feel like it. That was a bit rambly. <laughs> No, that was that was great. Um, I think I would echo, uh, like, well, everything you said, Oksana. Um, and I think that we both did spend time volunteering, um, in, you know, at the beginning of, of getting into our jobs and careers. Um, and it kind of feels like something that it was just part of the course, like it was just accepted that that's what you have to do. And I imagine that both of us obviously um, took on, a, you know, different amounts of um deficit whether that was like money or time um so i think the i think the sector has a lot of work to do actually in terms of volunteering um and olivia you you, you mentioned you know it, it, it's up to me it must be up to museums to kind of address this because there's not enough alternative ways to get into the sector and what the sector needs to offer is paid structured um you know traineeships apprenticeships paid internships and not volunteering um, routes necessarily for young people to get their first kind of steps on the ladder. Um, volunteering obviously is, you know, um, great and relevant and for people who want to do it as a passion, as a hobby alongside, you know, whatever else they're doing, brilliant. Um, and volunteers are so valuable to the sector, but it shouldn't be the only way that, that young people can gain experience. Um, so I think that we need to put some pressure on the sector around that um, and yes look for those opportunities that are paid that are structured that are formal that are absolutely giving you the experience that you want and that you need and if you're if you begin to communicate with museums about taking on a position make sure that you kind of state what you want to get out of it in the areas that you want to develop um, so that it's really working as hard as possible for you Right. Is that okay, Olivia? <laughs> yeah, that was really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, shall we move on to Emma? Hiya. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about freelancing because um, it seems like it's quite an attractive um, way of working for a lot of young people at the moment. Um, but how does freelancing actually work in the museum sector and like what are some of the advantages and disadvantages compared to say working on like a longer term contract? Great, um, that's a really good question, especially because it's freelancing as a way out of just being just volunteering or feeling like you're stuck in a rut with that. Um, so freelancing is quite simply museums they have a bank of people that they don't necessarily hire on a permanent full-time basis and it just means that they've got the a list of people that they would like to work with across like whatever um, whatever is their skill set and for particular departments and particular projects as well from a music like from a like a manager's point of view is quite cost effective because you're not paying for that person's like national insurance and tax and pension and all the other things that you would do with an employee. But the benefits for being self-employed is that you get to like play the field a lot. And that's great because you get to sample different teams, different organizations, different work cultures, like different people. And you, if, if you're someone who is like indecisive like me, I say indecisive, like I just really want to do everything and I don't want to be told no that I can't. Um, but if you're someone like who is like a jack of all trades and really wants to go down that route, like I really do recommend freelancing. But the caveat that I would say is that freelancing is like an emotional roller coaster because the highs are high and the lows are really low. Um, and it might seem like really intimidating when I say, you know, if I say consultant, you're like, what image, what person comes into your head? But if, if you're self-employed, you're basically on a zero hours contract that there is no difference because you're constantly hustling to make sure that you've got X amount in your bank account by this time. So when you are freelancing, you have to take into account your emotional well-being, take into account um, just like 
you you need to be resilient as well because you're always going to be hustling constantly like I can't remember the last time when I've not had to apply for something so you do have to watch out for that um and I think when there is like a crisis like we are right now freelancers tend to be like the bottom of the pile in terms of consideration because um organizations automatically think about how do they look out for their staff first so if you're someone who has got like certain clients that you go back to you might realize that you'll get ghosted so yeah that's like an overview Michelle um that's great I think it's really useful to have that overview um I've only done I've done a lot less freelance than you have Exana so and I think if you if you don't know that world it like it's a bit um mysterious isn't it so that's really good to have that that breakdown um I think yeah it's advantages and disadvantages isn't it and and weighing up whether it's right for you as an individual um obviously in terms of um becoming a successful freelancer I think we have to draw on those things that we were talking about earlier about networking and knowing your value and 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 you know putting yourself out there um yeah museums will kind of you know get to know certain freelancers and 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 obviously if they like your work they'll keep working with you um there is, I, I wanted to point out that there's actually a network called Museum Freelance, which again, there you go, already there's a community available, but on their website, they've also got loads of resources and tip, tips and hints and things for people who are interested in freelancing. So I'd say that's a really good, you know, first port of call um, to see if it's for you. Um, and, you know, also trying to find somebody or somebody else or other people who've done it and and find out about their experiences. I think there's probably a lot to learn. Um, and another point on on freelancing that I just wanted to kind of put out there. Again, this is this is more about museums and um, employers and leadership. Um, but when you're a freelancer, like you say, sometimes you can be. Um, put to the side a little bit and and your your needs aren't always necessarily um at the forefront of of um people's minds in museums and i think that you know for example as museum as muck if we're um working freelance one of the things that we have to do is is remind people to pay our invoices on time and that's really important when you need to plan your finances um if you you know you, you haven't just got some 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 cash um, in the attic lying around to 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 pick up to pay your rent and bills. You know you need to um, be able to plan your money, like you said. Um, so we have to kind of keep on top of um, museums as well and be like, you know, freelancers need X, Y, and Z. Um, so yeah, um, a bit of kind of <laughs> push, pushing pushing back again. Um, and just making your your needs known, I think, um, and, and that's in order to kind of um, prevent um, your well being kind of dipping. You know, putting those things in place beforehand, um, setting out your expectations. Yeah. Like a lot of what I learned from freelancing came from, I, I was on the Young Freelancers Programme at the London Transport Museum. So they'll be opening up their recruitment, I think, hopefully next week, fingers crossed. But it's just a way, it's like a really nice, gentle intro to just understanding how does freelancing work? Because when I was trying to figure out what I wanted in, in museums land, if I came across a consultant, chances are they were a posh lady with like brunette hair and like with 300 kids. And it's just like, that's not my life experience. And I don't know, but like there's, I know there's an aspect of like, I can learn from you, but like, I won't necessarily get where you're coming from because that person, that consultant, they're freelancing because they can afford to freelance. Whereas like young people who start out as freelancers, it's because they have had no other option to. And it's just the other side of the coin to being on a zero hours contract. Mm. But I do like what you're saying as well about then you're not committed to a certain organization and if you're early on in your career mm -hmm. you're probably still trying to find out which museums are right for you yeah you know so it's, a, it's kind of a good way to to test um to test them out and see see um if they fit with you know your values yeah like there is no like 
I think the best thing about being freelancing is if I'm treated like crap, I know that that's not the norm and I have the confidence to leave. Whereas like, unfortunately, when you, when you say, if you go for an entry level job and you get in, you don't know the other world. You don't know that there are actually kind people out there who know boundaries and know how to like pay people on time. So it's just, yeah, like you just get to know what you, what you value and what you don't, and you'll be like more bullshit with it because you have to keep thinking about your contracts and your rights and your cash flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question, Emma? Yeah, a lot of useful tips there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've got a question from Becky. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm from the British Museum Youth Collective. I have a question for you guys on future collaborations. Do you think there is a possibility that both of your organisations could collaborate in some way in the future with a particular focus on helping young people enter the sector? Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Um, shall I kick off, Exana? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, yes, like um, Museum as Map would, would love to do that. I think um, that would be amazing. Um, we have, you know, Detox and, and Museum as Map um, do um, kind of, you know, um, support each other and, and, and speak to each other. Um, and we have already collaborated on um, a programme called Space Exchange, which is um, it's actually a pilot run by an organisation called Space Invaders, which is um, for feminists in museums. So we've got a pilot programme running this year and it's about matching um, women with um, senior leaders in the sector. And we, um, we open that up to um, people from Museum as Muck and Museum Detox for this first pilot year because we wanted to make sure that those underrepresented groups were prioritised in this first year. Um, so that's um, been going on for a, a few months now, um, which is fabulous. And that really has, I think that really has led to, you know, a bit more communication between, um, between all of us and the groups. Um, so hopefully that, that pilot, you know, will go on. Um, but also, I know that um, the Museum as Muck Steering Group would be really super keen um, to, to, to do something around young people and careers. They talk about it a lot. Um, so it's something that's on our minds. And um, collaborating with Detox is also something that we've, we've spoken about as well. So we're here. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and just to like uh, underline that as well we have detoxes who are muckers as well because intersectional experiences so yeah it's, it, we are in communication with one another I think like with any network they do things like their own particular way as well so yeah definitely looking forward to seeing what a potential collaboration would look like I think because like museum detox is at the moment coordinated by volunteers it's one of those things where like there needs to be more deeper thinking um, just to make sure like everyone gets the most out of that experience as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it would be, I think one of the, one of the starting points would be to find the young people in um, those networks and, you know, get them um, involved in, in kind of planning and imagining what, what that kind of program could look like and what they want from it, what they need from it, and then how we can, make that happen so yes all for it ditto <laughs> <laughs> great so are we on to the live q a yeah i think maybe we're going over to kira oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, so people have been sending in their questions. Um, um, one that builds quite nicely on what you've just discussed there. Um, so you've both spoken about the effects of classism and racism in the industry, but um, this person was curious about whether you'd face any struggles in terms of sexism. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, just about every day of my life. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you know, museums are, in one breath, I was going to say, well, they're just representative of society and those prejudices that are there. 
but then at the same time I say museums aren't representative of society because they don't have all the communities in but um Yes, and um, Space Invaders, the group that I previously mentioned, um, obviously talk about this a lot. Um, and I imagine that a lot of us here today will have our own individual stories about um, um, sexism in the workplace as well. Um, so yes, uh, multiple oppressions going on. Um, again, you know, well, with, with something like that, I mean, um, it's it's something that you you know if if it's kind of um, serious things going on then you must um, report that um, within your organisation. Um, yeah. yeah. What about you, Oksana? Oh, for sure. I think it's interesting. So that in 2018 there was a pa um, something called the Panic Report, which looked into uh, the demographics and the breakdowns of the creative workforce and like the museum sector. In 2018, 2.7% um, were people of colour, and that's a ridiculously low number. Um, and then, but then by the same breath, like there's a lot of women who are employed in museums as well. So whilst we have that, you're also balancing with the fact that when you have a woman in the workplace, um, a lot of people need to unlearn what do they see as a person in power and authority? Like what does a leader look like and what are their values and how do they behave? And I think that's where sexism comes into play as well, because I mean, you only need to look at, I mean, how many female museum directors do we actually have in the UK? Even though like, if you look at any public learning team, yeah. a lot of women. That's it. That's that's what I was going to say. We're majority female-led workforce, but just look at the top. It's not it's not representative. So clearly, there's a gender issue in museums. Yeah. So if we go on to our next question, then, um, so this person's uh, isn't they've described themselves as not young, um, but they've been volunteering and working in museums for a few years now, and they feel like they keep going around in circles, um, and they just want about whether paid experience or a master's is more important. So with the COVID situation, is studying a more viable option than paid work? It really depends on your situation and like what you're comfortable with. Like everyone's journey is completely different. Um, so I wouldn't wanna recommend something that wouldn't necessarily fit you. I think thinking with my hat on when I used to work in a recruitment company, um, what people want is more accumulated experience of you haven't had work, you having experience of working in a workplace, whether or not it's on a shop floor, whether or not it's doing a shift at the pub or whether or not it's just like being in a museum, just something to say that you can work in a team, that you can communicate well and you get business on some level. Um, I think when you are thinking about doing a, like a master's in museum studies, you have to question yourself, like, do I need to access work experience by paying more than nine grand in tuition fee for that? And whether or not that's a debt that you really want to take going forward. So I'd recommend going into academia if you really love, you know, going down your research rabbit holes and love, like, if you love a subject to death, like, pursue your passions all for it. But if you're talking about getting work experience, I would say just maybe, like, if you can afford to, like, take a break from constantly applying for museum stuff and, like, think about other sectors as well, because they actually would love to have you on board, for sure. Like, TV and games like storytelling, that's another way. Like they're hiring loads at the moment because everyone's just been sat in front of their screens watching TV. So like there's loads of options out there, but with, with a master's in museum studies, it's just weighing up whether or not, like really, like I've had this question as well internally about whether or not I wanted a, a master's in museum studies. And I really, it just boiled down to, did I really want a master's or some sort of certainty for 12 months? Mm -hmm. And am I going to go into possibly like 12 to 15K in debt for that? 
when really I paid I, like my cohort of university students, we were the first ones to start paying 9K. And I can't believe that I paid 27K in total in tuition just to say in my CV, I have a bachelor's in history and politics. That's what it boils down to, to be honest. For me, like good luck with your journey. Yeah, I think um, it's a really interesting question. I've had it before, um, the, the the work experience versus MA route. Um, and like you said, it's it really is, it's down to you. And I think it, I think it should be a decision more around, yeah, whether you, you are that person who wants to um, learn theoretically and deeply through an MA um, in that way. Um, rather than it just being seen as if I do the MA, that's going to help me get a job. Um, because that's not necessarily true. Um, I, I, did, I never did an MA. Um, wasn't right for me. Obviously, couldn't afford it. Um, but also, I just didn't feel like I wanted to go down that route academically. Um, and work experience... Um, all the value in that is you know learning through doing um and actually you whilst you're doing that you're also making those connections with organizations and with people in the sector as well um so yeah it, there's no right answer it's 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 down to the individual i think thank you um so then our next question um, we've had a couple of questions come in about getting into the UK um, museum sector when you're international. So how difficult is it for international students to obtain museum inter internships in the UK? Um, and what kind of qualifications um, might they need if they were if they had international qualifications, for example? Do you think that would have an effect on their ability to get into the sector here? I'm going to normalise and say I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I'm really sorry. I think in general anyway, like we have a really hostile environment towards immigration and it's really, really tough when you're an international student and it's not fair. Um, and I know that like explicitly no employer will say that they do not want an international person, but when they're asking questions about what tier visa you're on, that that in itself is quite questionable about what their intentions are and whether or not like they are asking that question to rule out potential candidates. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love that you normalise saying that you don't know. Um, that's a quality I've, I often admire in people. And I, I'll, I'll have to say that I don't really know the answer either. Um, but I, I, I'm struggling to even think of how to direct or signpost people to to the right answer. So if anyone ha has a response that maybe they can add, put it into the chat and, and that can be shared later on. Yeah, because I'd love to know more as well, because I think whenever any museum like, you know, learning team, whenever they program for things, they don't take into account that not everyone who goes to those events or workshops or that volunteering program is a British citizen and the barriers that they face because of it. So there's that citizenship issue. And also just thinking about like how Anglo-centric our programming is and how that's a barrier as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of food for yeah. food. And just, I suppose, in terms of recruitment and, and that question specifically around, you know, what qualifications um, might kind of translate. Or, I mean, I think that museums thinking about recruitment, um, you know, we're, we're often kind of um, driving them to think about whether, you know, they say, do you need an MA to do this job? Do you need a degree to do this job? can we think about roles just more in terms of skills and experience? Um, and that, you know, by leaning towards that way of recruiting, then maybe that opens up, you know, um, international students um, in terms of thinking whether their qualifications apply or not, just in terms of those kind of formal qualifications. But yes, I think we'd love to hear more if anyone has more expertise than us 
No worries. Um, so then another question for you guys. So how can I get museums and other institutions to reply to my job applications? Would it be considered impolite to send a follow-up email if I never get a response? This is something I've experienced as well. <laughs> so this is definitely hitting home. Can I, can I just be honest? I applied for a job in lockdown 1.0 and I've still yet to find out whether or not I'm going to be invited for an interview. <laughs> fingers yeah. crossed fingers crossed I'm in the running <laughs> yeah no, yeah it's not uh, no <laughs> yeah like it could be it could oh, be. Um, no it's not look it's really not too much or it, it's it's kind of it's rude for people to not get back to you when you've put effort into applying for jobs um as somebody who has spent a lot of time filling out those applications and going through that process um I think you know a minimum is like um a response to acknowledge that mm -hmm. um as somebody who hires I will say that in ter in terms of feedback um if you haven't been selected for interview um that's not something my team has capacity to do and it's, it's literally about capacity so I can't get back to everyone who um won't get an interview but I will always provide feedback for somebody who's been to an interview um, and I will always respond and acknowledge um you know an application because and and I will try to say how much I appreciate in that application the time the energy and the effort that these things take because I really do understand um and so yeah I mean I feel free to chase people if they haven't responded yeah yeah like for, for the record I did chase still haven't heard back but I think with 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 when it comes to just the way that I I did applications is when I sent the email of my cover letter and see <clears throat> in that email text I would say can you please con confirm the receipt of my application and that would be the jolt to hopefully get them to say yes I've got it um, and I and I think the other thing as well is I think because I've just perpetually applied for things constantly I know that if I haven't heard within two weeks that means I haven't got it and for me to just manage my emotional well-being when it comes to job applications I don't work longer than three hours on something because it's not worth it like I don't know whether or not it's going to end up to you know to a job and you know because it's so competitive more often times I don't get the gig so for me I've just saved myself from getting really like but hurt about it when I don't get yeah. it so yeah three hours and I and I yeah. and I'm just a bit like I have a formula so when it comes to like the cover letter like I I tailor it to the organization but I have like certain sentences that I do use to show an example of whatever is in their person spec as well. So it's more thinking about how can you save yourself just the emotional rigmarole when you don't get it as well. And I think the other thing just to echo with what Michelle has said, um, a recruitment, when, a, when an organization is recruiting, like what they do is really a, an insight into how they will be if you were to work for them. And if they don't respond kindly or in time, Lord help you. Because that just means that team is really busy and like they can't afford to have those conversations like meaningful ones if something big were to come down the line. Yeah, good tip there. And I, I love the three hour rule. I wish I could tell that to my younger self. That's a really good one. I know, think of how many like TV episodes you could have watched in that time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But I could have enjoyed myself. So yeah, like I always made sure I never did an application on a Friday, Saturday or Sunday. This is amazing. Like I just didn't this want to such good self care myself. boundaries. Yeah, really good. And just like, and I think the when it comes to chasing people, call people up. I don't know what it is, but jet like millennials hate phone calls. Call them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a power move <laughs> so yeah <laughs> that that usually helps get things going oh my god I so wish I had these tips when I was applying like with my little color-coded spreadsheet of like oh they've got back to me like that was a no like oh I haven't heard from them in six months like who knows we'll see <laughs> <laughs> but um thank you for that I think that's going to be really good um for anyone out there who's applying really inspiring um 
So then you both represent networking groups for marginalized communities. Um, do you know of any similar groups for queer or LGBT people looking to get into the sector? Yes, there, there are. There are, there are um, a couple, a few. Um, I, oh gosh, let me think. I'm, um, I just know them through their Twitter handles. This is, this is what I'm trying to think of. <laughs> It's, the, it's all these people you're, you're on Twitter with. Um, how terrible, I can't think of any. There are. <laughs> Is there any way that if we could collate the list and give it to you guys to share with people who are- Yeah, talking? that's a really poor, that's a really poor show. Yeah. Um, Queers in Museums, Queer Britain, Queerzeum. Oh. Museum bums, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, well, we've got, um, I've got somebody on the Museum as Muck Twitter account tweeting, right, tweeting this live. So maybe people can respond to the Museum as Muck Twitter and we can do some shout outs. Perfect, fab. Um, so everyone, make sure you go to Twitter after we finish today and check those out. Uh, so then for our next question, um, is there anything being done to address the barriers to disabled people trying to get into the sector? Yeah, I think what the whole year has shown is how ableist our workplaces are. And like, for, so, like even just to ask for accommodations, like being worried that that's going to count you out. So for some people, working from home has been like a blessing in disguise because of that because they're now able to work on their own terms or work quite flexibly um and I think because of like the fact that the pandemic has submerged people into working from home they're now understanding how ableist things were in the beginning and now it's really up to people when they come back and return return to the office whether or not it's virtual whether or not they want to go back to the old normal or create a new one? Yeah, I think actually perhaps the positive from the pandemic is that it has shown that we can be way more flexible to our um, staff and the people that work in museums. Um, and of course it should always, it should be this way to start with, um, but, being more flexible in terms of, like you say, um, working from home or hours or whatever it is. Um, there's kind of, there's there's a precedent set now to show that that, that it can be done. Um, and there are many people in the sector who are um, working towards more inclusivity for people with disabilities. Um, Museum DCN is um, an organisation that, that um, works very hard at that. Thank you. Um, so for our next question, um, so we obviously talked about men, uh, networking earlier um, as a tool to meet people within the museum and the heritage sector. So um, to just follow up, is there any elaboration on how to, how to get about this? Are there any do's or don'ts? Um, and how do you navigate getting a job experience or applying for a job? Um, through that. Sorry, like in terms of networking, a how to. Yeah. Message someone, like be polite, and like a sentence or two about why you're reaching out to them and what would you like to get out of it. And then if you do go ahead with like meeting virtually on Zoom or having a phone call, following up and saying thank you and just keeping in touch. Um, I think when when I was at uni, everyone always really em emphasised LinkedIn. And I've, I really don't like LinkedIn. It's horrible if you're a freelancer because it just makes you seem like you can't hold down a job. <laughs> but like with... Um, yeah, like Twist is really good for that because you get to know someone's character and you get to know what their values are. And like, even like sometimes museum people don't necessarily want to talk about their job all the time. Like you can bond over shared interests, like, I don't know, Brooklyn Nine-Nine 
or selling sunset or something <laughs> so yeah there's there's more like I think if you just talk about it like approach it like if I wanted to be friends with someone how would I go about it yeah that's 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 a good idea actually yeah I think that it is it's like I think networking whilst being yourself um and not necessarily trying to act the same way as as other people in the sector um like bringing your own identity to it um and whilst you're doing it just make it really just tell everyone I'm looking for a job I'm looking for a job (laughs) just make it really clear that that's 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 what it that's how it leads into um experiences because you know um Exana might have I might have met her for a coffee and she'd say, look, I'm looking for a job in museum learning. And then next time I see a job come up, I'm like, oh, Exana was looking for a job like this. I'm going to forward it to her. So therefore, you know, people will um, kind of think of you and signpost you to opportunities as well. Yeah, like thinking about the, the way that I did it was I was so like, I think I was just really academic when I was like, like I had an academic approach to the job hunt like so I looked at the job I'd like to have like immediately <laughs> and then the job like that would be the dream job and I would oftentimes because people are hiring you know I just tend to save those job descriptions and like honestly like you say researching but it's really stalking on social media <laughs> like you find people who work for whatever organization that you like to work with and you just follow them um that sounds really stalkery but it's more like in a polite way and I think what you find is like Twitter is such a good space for just getting to know people um and half the time I actually do forget that like I'm meant to be using my Twitter somewhat professionally but like I really don't (laughs) so yeah I think it's more that what what Michelle was saying about like being yourself like I can't emphasize that enough like there's only one of you like you have the flavor and the source like be yourself you don't need to be someone else that you're not like when when as you get older in the field people will eventually be looking up to you and if you are like just you just you and that's it that's more than enough and that's inspirational oh I think that's really lovely uh, so how can we decentralise the sector to improve access and opportunities in museums that are outside of London? As in have more gigs outside of London? I think so. Yeah, so I am um, so I grew up in London and I'm currently based in a town called Leamington um, in Warwickshire. And unfortunately what you have to do is look at where the you have to follow the money trail um and you can see which organizations have larger pots of money outside of london and those organizations tend to have those programs for developing skills um for young people um and they tend to be again unfortunately quite cities based as well so if you can't drive you're quite limited um so it really depends on what the setup is. That's like the bigger picture. So chase the money and unfortunately it's quite city focused. Yeah, I don't I, I don't think I can add to that. It is it's unfortunately, obviously, um London is full of museums, um the sectors um quite London centric um but obviously there are so many incredible places outside of London um and I again I think yeah you've you've pointed out Exana it's about looking for those amazing opportunities um that are funded programs for young people in in those organizations um which um I want to point out that the British Museum runs a program and I've forgotten its name. Is it the Youth Collective? <laughs> no, there's, a, there's another one. There's another one um, where, the, where the trainees. Oh, yeah. museum, I think it's Museum Traineeship. Yeah. Museum Traineeship, yes. And that's um, organisations all over. So it's about, yeah, chasing where those kind of um, pots of pots of money and programmes are. Yeah, 
And I think the only thing to take into consideration, like when I, I decided to move out of London because I just couldn't afford the rent and I like to have my own space. So when I moved over here, I just knew for a fact that because I don't have a driving license, I was quite limited in my capacity to move around for my career. So, and also the other added thing is, there's a, if you're an ethnic minority, there's so much security in being in a city. Like, I don't think I would be very comfortable in a very rural part of the UK. I would stick out like a sore thumb. And like, I would inadvertently just, I know from even being in cities, like I, I would become the informal diversity consultant. So it's just about like, no, like there's other things that you have to factor in as well when you're looking for something outside of London. I mean, it's possible, but yeah, just added things to think about. Thank you. Um, so for both of you now, how and when did you know that a career in the museum sector was for you? <laughs> I think I, um, it took me a really long time to get to it. As in, I didn't really, you know, I, di I didn't um, know that, I didn't have any experience of going to museums as a, as a child, as a young person. I think the first time I went to one was like when I was about 19 or 20. Um, so it took me a really long time to get to it. And um, when I first kind of encountered it, I was like, oh my God, yes, I can do this. And then it, and then I had like basically like quite a few years of being like, oh yeah, it's, it's quite difficult for someone like me actually to navigate this. Um, but now I'm, I'm in love with them again. <laughs> you know, when, <clears throat> if you're passionate, about museums which basically we all are because otherwise we wouldn't be doing these jobs um you know there's so much there's so much that, that there's so much good going on there's so much you can get out of it and you can do so many different jobs in museums it's not just being a curator um you know you can do marketing in a museum you can do finance you can look after estates um so they are in incredible places but I think that um, I kind of wish that when I first realised I wanted to work in museums, I also realised exactly what kind of environment they were for working class people. And hopefully, you know, but with Museum as Muck, what we can do is get people at that beginning and support them from then. Um, so they're not kind of trying to navigate it for years um, without that, that support and advice. I think for me personally, it was like, so for my A-levels, I did history, politics, English and French. And then for uni, I just dropped two and kept with history and politics. And then when I was still studying, I just couldn't understand when I would be in my seminars. And like, I actually remember like my face dropping when like there was a guy who just said, yeah, I'm just going to be an accountant. How did you end up like <laughs> on my course and decided you want to go down and do maths? Okay, you do you. I support your endeavors. But yeah, it just made me realize like the logical, I feel like because I spent so much time and especially being like amongst the first in my family to go to uni, like your education is so it means so much. And I couldn't fathom a future where I didn't use my degree or like use it in some way. So for me, like museums seem like that logical conclusion. And when I think about why am I still in the sector, Museum Detox has been like that saving grace for me and showing the generosity and spirit that I'm not alone and that there are other people like me out there and I can breathe a little. Um, because there are some wild, wild, wild people in organizations. Um, so yeah, there's that. And I think, I mean, case in point, like if you go on my Twitter, my uh, my Twitter header picture is like a snapshot of like a rejection email that I got about why I was unsuitable for them. And it basically said that, oh, you're too young people-y and now I'm here. So screw you, whoever, if you're still watching, shame. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. <laughs> but yeah, I think love, I love working with young people. Um, I love the communities that I'm a part of and a little bit spite. Like you tell me I can't do something and I'm going to stay here. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. So unfortunately, that's all the questions that we have time for today. Um, so I'd like to thank our speakers um, and just remind everyone that tomorrow uh, the Youth Collective's uh, conversation with the director of the British Museum um, is on YouTube at four o'clock. And we are also recruiting for the next Youth Collective. So if this seems like something you'd be interested in, make sure you check out our application form online. And I will now hand over to Afsal to finish us up. Thank you very much, Kira. And that was a brilliant event. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Oksana and Michelle and the Youth Collective. And uh, yeah, we're going to wrap up. We're a bit over time, but thank you very much for everyone uh, who attended. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Goodbye.